Hi. Um, awesome. Um, really excited to join you all today. Um, uh, and thanks very much to Product School for uh, giving me this opportunity to come to talk to you. Um, so let's get stuck into it. Um, so I'm Andrew Howe. Um, my mantra, I like a good mantra. I don't know if you guys know uh, Guy Kawasaki. He's one of my favorite people out in, in, the, in the world. Uh, but he says everyone should have a mantra. So I, I, a number of years back, I said, what is it that really drives me with when I work? And, and that mantra was that uh, products empower in lives. So I really like, and, and, and definitely now, uh, we'll, we'll only really look at working um, uh, for companies where I feel like the product that I'm trying to generate is going to have an impact on people's lives in a positive way. Um, so I think it's really um, it's really important for for, for me um, to to be working at a company like that. And and, and at the moment I work at, at Booking.com, so I really get that opportunity there. Booking is a great place for products. Um, it's, it's definitely got that product uh, outcome thinking going on, um, which is one of the reasons that um, I've I've been been there for a while now, and I can't see myself um, leaving for a little while. But yeah, everything's um, everything there is the the right way to do things. Um, so just skipping forward now. So um, so yeah, again, background would be um, I I've worked in startups in the financial services industry in non for profits and obviously now in in the, in the global travel industry. Not all of that has been in in product roles. Sometimes you know I've started I've done business analysis earlier on in my career. Um, I uh, did uh, commercial strategy, um, but I made the shift over to product roughly about uh, six or seven years ago, maybe a little bit longer. Um, it just was a natural progression from all of the different uh, places that, and different skills that I pulled together uh, for me to take a step into product. So what are we here today? We, we want to talk about uh, outcome thinking, and uh, specifically, we're going to have a chat about uh, product outcome thinking. Um, it's a bit of a, 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 an odd subject. There's a lot out there. If you if you go out into into Google and out onto the the wider internet, and you start doing a bit of a, a bit of googling, you'll you'll find that there's a lot of information about about product thinking. And people have very different views or lenses that they put on it. You know, you might see people talk about um, technology thinking and then problem thinking and outcome thinking. Um, you know. Uh, some people might talk about outputs and, uh, and outcomes, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but, you know, really, uh, th those are all things that make up outcome thinking. They are a different type of thinking. They're all part of the same thing. And, and I think, the th in, in, in my personal view, we, it, it's not the right thing to do to say you shouldn't think about output. Uh, output is an important part of outcomes, right? You have to understand the output process and what it's doing. Uh, but really, where, you, where we want to be as product managers is in that uh, in that out product outcome mindset. So, um, what does, what does that actually mean? Well, well, we'll have a bit of a chat about that now. Um, so, just to, to, to define quickly what an output is because that's most of the thing that people always say you know if, if we should be doing outcomes not output so output is the amount of something that you can generate or machine can generate or an industry can generate uh, and it's the volume of things right and um, and that's important because uh, if we want to build something or create something we have to know how well we can do that how what's I and mean, what's involved to do that right so um we shouldn't completely disregard output output is a fundamental part of of outcome thinking um so you can be super productive uh, from an output perspective and you can be super efficient but the question is are you being effective? And this is where we start to get into the realms of outcomes, right? So uh, effectiveness is, is the outcome, right? Productivity, efficiency are the measures around the output. So here's a really great example, which I really like, about, you know, if you just outputted yourself to the place that you want to be, that outcome 
have you built it the most effective way, right? So for example, do I really need to build a bread machine within a bread machine to, to make a loaf of bread? Okay, it's a, it's a classic Simpsons example of a problem. Um, so what is an outcome then? Let's have a look, let's, let's flip it now. Let's, let's talk about outcomes. So outcomes are basically the consequence of something, right? So it's the way that the thing turned out. It, it, it's not the process in getting there. And, and this is where we as product owners or product managers or product leads, whatever you, know, um, you, you guys are calling yourselves at the moment, this is where we want to spend our time and our think, a lot of our thinking, right? And everything that we should be doing should be about facilitating an outcome driving um, that the you know everything towards that helping the team helping each other to make that outcome a reality so how do we go about shaping an outcome and getting to a place where we can understand that outcome well first off you've, you've really got to make sure that everyone understands the problem right and 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 what we really mean by this is that you guys as a, as a team have spent sufficient time in the problem space. And, and what you've done there is you've validated that there's a desirability to solve that problem with customers. Um, now, you can, um, once you've got that, that understanding, you know, you can do really quick exercises here around things like just jumping up on a jam board, getting everything that you know about that problem just shoved into one space and then theming it really quickly so that you can get an understanding of the different subcategories of problems that exist within that. And a really good example of a problem here in the digital realm would be something like that um, you're losing customers at your checkout page uh, in your e-commerce journey, right? Customers are going through all the steps, they're getting to checkout, and then you're dropping a lot. And then when you go out into the wider market and you're looking for benchmarks on what conversion looks like, you seem to be 10% down on everybody else or even worse, right? So you have a problem now. You have a problem and, and then you can go out to customers, you can do some discovery around it and you can say, hey, what is the problem? Try and contextualize that problem now a little bit more with your customers. So um, so we, we've, we've now gone through that and we haven't just done that as a single person exercise. We've done that as a team. We've, we've understood the problem as a team and that's really important because if you are the only person that understands the problem, how are you going to be supposed to generate ideas or ways of solving that problem that's going to generate the outcome that you as a product manager want to create, right? So this isn't about being an individual. So product is not a, you know, a, a, a one-person sport. It, it's a team uh, sport. It's an activity that is team-orientated, and you have to have that in your mindset. You, really, your job as a product manager is there to facilitate that everyone else's success. So, um, so yeah, so we, we, we've understood that problem. Everyone's got their head around that, uh, that part of the things. So then we're going into that ideation phase. How might we solve that problem, right? And this is where we're going to spend a bit of time with, with the team. And again, we're going through another exercise of, of ideation, the workshop, and we're going to start pulling out ideas. Now, we don't just want to pull out ideas and say, oh, we're going to do that, because then we're getting into the realms of output, right? So you can have a list of 100 things, and you go, right, I'm going to, Go and make all those hundred things, and that's going to get me my ten percent back, right? And um, but actually, what we're doing there is being we're not being effective, we're, and we're probably not being very efficient. We're, we're probably being very productive because we got a hundred things that we can go and build and go and build them, but we're, we're not probably doing that in the right way. Um, and what we mean by that is um, that hundred things you may only need to have actually done. 10 of those to get to where you want to get to. Or it may be only 10 of those are actually the things you need to care about that are going to get you where you want to get to. So this is where we now have to start thinking about putting some rigor around those things. And this is where things like hypotheses um, can really help us to, to understand that. So we got, we, so first off, so we got that, um, that, that how might we, the ideas, and we want to make sure that we can measure those things, right? So have we got a measure that sits around those that gives us that ability to say, hey, something, is this measurable? So I've got an idea, 
Is it measurable? Can I go into the thing, make that change, and see that movement? Because what we're trying to generate here, product outcomes are behavioral changes, okay? They're not, um, we're trying to change the behavior of a customer to do something more in line with where we want them to go. So in this instance, so the example we're talking about, we want them to convert more, we want them to check out more, right? Um, so to do that, we need to make sure that we can make a measure between the current experience and the things that we're changing. And we may use things like A-B experimentation, but we need to make sure that we have either micro conversion events or, you know, or, or other events available, data points that allow us to be able to measure that successfully. So we have a measure in place uh, and, we're, and we're, we're confident that we can make that measure. So the next step then is, okay, let's, we've got that hypothesis now. So we, when we talk about hypotheses, that I, I always talk about Teresa Torres. Um, she's really great at, at, at defining all of this sort of problem space and, and also the structure of, of hypotheses. Um, but she uses this very, and I love this example, and it's something we use very similar here at Booking. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if I design this, which is the change, uh, this will increase the conversion, so that's the impact uh, for the, the who here, so the online grocery shoppers, and by how much? By 10%. Uh, and, and also, there's a time box on that there as well, because um, we're saying that this is going to happen in seven days. And this comes back to you know making sure that we're doing the due diligence uh, on our data analysis to say that we have the volume to be able to return that experiment within this window of time, right? But again, just to flip this, this is obviously digitally orientated. You can use this same method for you know, you know, in, uh, manufacturing and things like this because you still want to create an impact, right? So you're going to change something to create that impact. So it may be that you're doing something there. You want to uh, you change the color of a T-shirt, right? And that's you think you're going to increase the number of sales of that T-shirt um, for you know you know 18 to 30 year olds um who shop on your website by five percent and it's going to happen over the next 30 days right you can use hypotheses in lots of different ways and um, so we've got a hypothesis and we've got a set of hypotheses so we might have more than once we've got a load of ideas now that allow us to uh, that, that we think are the things that are going to solve that problem we put some value around them and we prioritize them so out of the hundred things actually there is only 10 that we care about because if we get those 10 we're going to over um, uh, deliver on what our outcome is which is we want to create 10 percent impact to uh, the uh, the checkout on, on our e-commerce site. So we uh, so now we've we've got that and stripped out the waste. So we've reduced our output down to what we believe is the thing that's going to create the most effectiveness. And um, and we prioritize that in our back backlog. And now we're going to go into the realms of going and delivering that right. But before we do that. We want to explain that and set some focus around that. So we want to make sure that the wider business understands it, other teams, and also that we as a team have something that gives us the ability to understand that easily. And there's a great framework for that, and it's basically the OKR framework. And we use this at booking.com, and I've used it in other places as well. So we set an objective, we want to make that inspiring. So, you know, we want to make an amazing checkout experience that really invigorates our customers to, to convert, um, additional customers convert a checkout. We've got a measure that we can measure our key results against, which is the, 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 the checkout conversion. And, we, uh, and instead of just saying we're going to hit, we want to increase this by 10%, which is a very specific number, and um, what OKR allows you to do is give yourself a bit of range. And especially if you've got more ideas than maybe you might need, you've got a couple of extra ideas to make sure that if something fails, you've got something you can fall back on, right? So for example, you have a 0.3, a 0.7, and a 0.1, right? So when you look at those 0.3s, that 0.7, and that 1, this is basically a range of uh, outcomes. Uh, and what we would say something like is, hey, our point three might be, uh, you know, 8%. We're going to get 8% towards our desired outcome of 10 uh, in this next window of delivery. 
and uh, the seven may be the you know the 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 ten percent, and the one point may be you know twelve percent. But the reason why we have that range is because the point three is something that we're really confident on, and that eight percent might be a lot easier to get to uh, because the things there are some things that are just broken in the site or things that we can fix we know that are going to improve conversion right but actually making so we're really confident on that one but making the then the the, the leap from the point three to the point seven there's a little bit less confidence there we're still we're in the realms of possibility and um, but we're not as confident as we were at the point three but we're not so unconfident, you know, it's not completely stretching us uh, that it's not within the realms of us achieving. And we want to aim for that 0.7. That's where we're aiming for that in our OKRs, right? That's what we want to try to achieve as success. And then our 1.0 is, is that, hey, if, if everything went amazing and we absolutely smashed it and, and, and things just happened, then we think that we could potentially achieve this additional 2% on top of that. So what that gives us, us then as a product team, uh, and uh, especially around our outcome focus, is a range of success. And that means that it's, it's, it's going to be more manageable for us to hit some success and learn from that. Now, if we fail to hit that, that's not the end of the world, right? Failure isn't a final step. Um, it's just an opportunity to learn. But what we don't want to do is fail again through the same mechanism and same mistake. We want to uh, learn from that and improve so the next time we do hit our OKR. So OKR is a really good tool because it allows us to also say, hey, if we under forecast what we can achieve or if we overstretched ourselves, the next time we just need to, need to learn from that and ping it back a little bit. And it helps keep us focused and also helps make sure that we're not over pushing ourselves out of the realms of what is actually possible within those cycles. So yeah, OKR, really great framework, um, but then you're in the doing, right? You've set your OKR and now you're in the quarter and your team's running and you know, you're, you're getting into it. So where are you now? Well, you're still that facilitator and leading up to that place, you should have been doing your planning and identified lots of things like your dependencies, try to remove as many of those things as a team as you possibly can. Uh, but your realm uh, as a product manager in this space is to continue to make sure that the things get facilitated. And also the challenge here, I think, especially when you get um, PMs that are, or POs that are coming new into the space, there's a tendency to get stuck into the detail. And detail is important, um, but your role here uh, at this stage is to take a step back from that and to be able to make sure that you're continuing that job uh, uh, of doing that outcome facilitator role, right? So, you know, is there everything, have you got everything you need? How's the experimentation going? Is there any data problems? Have we, have we underestimated? Do we need an, another skill set we don't have when, right? I'll go and get those things so that the team can continue to move towards the outcome success that we want to drive, right? Uh, and, and, and again, remind, reminding ourselves here that we're trying to drive a, 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 a customer behavioral change, you know, are we measuring those things effectively? So sometimes the thing that we need to do in that instance is make sure that we're giving ourselves time to take that condor moment. And what's a condor moment? Well, a condor moment is basically when you take a step back. You know, making sure that you take a step back and you're looking at the, the, the space holistically and you're going, where are we? Where, what's the confidence like? Are we uh, going, have we spent too much time on this hypothesis? Is it not working? Shall we switch over to the next one in the list or our, our next one in our priorities? Because if we spend any more time in this, then we're potentially going down the rabbit hole. It, it's, it's making sure that as you're facilitating those conversations with the team, as well as making sure that anything that could be blocking the team, you're working on. Because if you get to the end of the quarter, and the difference between you hitting your 0.3 in your OKR and hitting your uh, 0.7 in your OK was that the team got blocked for a week, um, and you weren't, you weren't aware of that because you were in the detail of something else, or uh, that blocker where you know didn't get raised quickly enough because you weren't um, able to to manage that amount of information or whatever the the, the challenge was being, then you, there's an element of like we've all failed, right? But we can learn from that because next time you need the the the, the other thing is 
let's make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's about you taking a step back, make sure that you're having that opportunity to make sure that everything's where it should be, um, but also that then you're working with the team to make sure that your feedback loops are fast and, uh, and, and that you're getting that information that you can do, and that rather than that the teams get stuck on it, that you're able then to go and facilitate a, a, a way out of that problem, right? Um, so yeah, so making sure you have those times to take a step back is really important. And also coming back to this planning thing. Um, so planning, people don't put enough time into planning. Um, I, plans are only as good as the moment they were written. Um, but planning is a, a, is a really important um, pro, uh, a tool. Um, and it's important because let's say we go back to that list. We have that list of you know, five things uh, that we're going to do or 10 things we're going to do. Well, what happens if none of those things return, right? Uh, but we're early enough in the quarter to do something about it. Or we're going down the track and it doesn't quite work out. Well, this is where our planning comes into effect because our plan isn't going right. But our planning has gone into enough detail to say there are other opportunities here and we can pull another player or a different set of tactics in to be able to um, try and... Oh, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, sorry, just had a bit of a glitch in. Um, so planning, yeah, so planning um, is really important. Again, it's like I say, so if, if you've got that space um, and you have all of those potential other tactics and, uh, that you could come into your disposal around that problem, it will potentially give you that opportunity to still achieve that outcome or part of that outcome uh, without completely failing. So um, planning is a really important step. And you should, you know, one of the things I always say is that we, as a team, we always put time into planning and we start that early enough so that it's just a part of the process and it can be managed well, well and efficiently. Um, so, yeah, so it does lead to outcome success because those times where you get to a place where you can't go down the route that you originally planned to, it gives you that flexibility to move left and right around those issues uh, to still facilitate back through into that outcome that you want to generate. So the idea here is about the flow of things rather than being so rigid uh, that things just don't happen. And again, what we tend to find, or you may find, is, is that things like methodology and things like that can get in the way. They're really important, um, uh, but sometimes we need to be more flexible than that. And as a team working down, sitting down about how you want things to play out and what are your you know, fallbacks is a really um, mature um, uh, product type of thinking that I think is not always prevalent in all teams. Um, so yeah, so planning definitely equals outcome success. Um, so just quickly as well, I wanted to quickly lastly talk about this. Um, so again, another thing that can really make a difference between um, you know the type of impact outcomes are generating and the impact that they can generate is the type of thinking that you have. So um, if you're in a very predictable space, so you're thinking very linearly, uh, you're doing optimization, you're taking it from one optimization to the next, and uh, then you're always moving uh, forwards, but you're moving forwards at a very predictable and, and, and sometimes a slow pace, right? So you might be making very small, minor improvements to the, the overall thing that you want to try and uh, impact. Um, where sometimes if you think more exponentially, what you can do is you can skip some of that stuff. So rather than taking that nice gentle curve, you're gonna you're gonna make that curve go up more 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 erratically, more sorry, not erratically, more more quickly, and um, because you're gonna take some risks, right? So if you can get into a place where you're premature around your process and and, and how you're working as a team and the practice that you have. And, you know, thinking about how you can be more exponential in your thinking can be a real benefit as well in product thinking. Because what you're trying to say is, okay, this is the sort of customer behavioral problem that I have at the moment. These are some of the things I could fix it with right now or potentially improve it with. But, hey, where did we think customers may be in X time from now? And is there an opportunity to jump to that place and pull it forward? Uh, and in doing so, you potentially have created a bit of a USP or, 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 or a new curve 
um, that puts you in front of your competition and also, you know, makes your customers have a better experience and maybe think that you're a bit more cutting edge around your, the, the other things that are in the market. So uh, another thing that we tend to use quite a lot in our teams that I work with is, is there an exponential way that we can solve this problem uh, that's going to get us uh, not just the outcome that we want, but maybe push us past that as well um, to, um, to, to drive towards more of the, the vision uh, or, the, uh, or the wider goals that we're trying to achieve. So just something I wanted to, to quickly talk to you guys about. And again, um, a really good book um, that's worth reading. If you haven't read it already, I know that probably a lot of you have, is Radical Focus. Um, brilliant book, great, easy read, really uh, easy to understand how OKRs can be at work and how they can be implemented. You're, you can get through this really quickly, uh, really practical ways as well. I think even in the back, it's, it's startup oriented, but in the back it has a lot of product stuff as well. So great, great book to read. And again, I think I mentioned Teresa Torres earlier, who's um, also someone I think has got a real load of good stuff on, on product thinking and how to think about problem spaces. Um, yeah, so uh, that's it. That covers everything. I hope this has been um, a really uh, useful session. Um, uh, there's a lot out there. I'm not a guru on it. Uh, this is just the thoughts and experiences, the things that I've done and things that work for me. I'm sure that you guys have got a load of things that work for you as well. So, um, you know, don't, don't be afraid to share them with the world. Anyway, brilliant. Thank you very much.